Hi, everyone. Um, it seems that we have a critical mass here, so it makes sense to go ahead and get started. My name is Michaela Morris, and I'm an Oceans Fellow with Environment New Hampshire. We're a statewide nonprofit that works to protect clean air, clean water, and open spaces. First, I want to thank you all for joining us um, this evening for the virtual Right Whale Roadshow. Although we're not physically together this evening to celebrate and learn about right whales, we're, we are grateful for opportunities like this to come together and connect. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Blue Ocean Society for Marine Conservation, Bow Seat Ocean Awareness Programs, the New England Aquarium, Conservation Law Foundation, and the Seacoast Science Center for partnering with us to host this event. In a moment, we'll dive into the digital art exhibition, panel, and Q&A. But first, I wanted to share a little about my experiences working to preserve the oceans and protect right whales. So I got into this work um, because I grew up on the seacoast of New Hampshire, and I love the beach. This love for the ocean and everything that lives in it motivates me to advocate for strong protections for right whales. Right whales are amazing animals. They swim right off our coast in New England. Some can be found socializing with one another in groups at the surface. And mothers, who form strong bonds with their young, use low, whispering tones with their calves. But tragically, scientists estimate that there are only about 400 North Atlantic right whales left. This means that they're an endangered species. As an oceans associate with Environment New Hampshire, though, I've learned that the fate of the right whale is, still, is not set in stone. We still have a chance to save them. Right now, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association is in the midst of a rulemaking process to protect right whales. Lawmakers have also introduced a bill called the Save Right Whales Act um, that would offer strong protections for right whales through the development of ropeless fishing technology. You'll learn more about these two things and the tools we have to protect right whales later on in the webinar. But before I turn the floor over to our panelists, I want to leave you all with a memory I've thought a lot about as I've been setting up this webinar. The summer before my senior year of college, I saw my first whale. I was a lifeguard and it was one afternoon in mid-August and I was alone on post. And then I saw a dorsal fin surface far off in the distance. I wasn't sure if it was a whale or a shark and I was a little bit nervous, but then the whale lunged out of the water. Um, its entire body was suspended above the ocean for a minute and then it was gone and the horizon was smooth again. The whale's momentary appearance reminded me of how much mystery, majesty, and beauty that our oceans hold. As residents of New England, where the ocean is integral to our identity, we have a special imperative to protect our oceans and the creatures that call our ocean home. Right whales, which swim right off the coast of, New, our, of the New England, are a part of this marine legacy and are ours to protect. That's why I'm so glad to see so many people here this evening and hopefully together we can save them. Now I'm going to turn the floor over to Alyssa Irizari, Senior Vice President of Bow Seat Ocean Awareness Programs for a digital tour of some beautiful artwork. Thank you, Michaela, and hi everyone. Um, thanks again to all of you for joining us this evening or uh, whatever time it is where you are tuning in from. My name again is Alyssa Irizari and I'm the Senior Vice President of Bow Seat Ocean Awareness Programs. We are a Massachusetts-based nonprofit working to engage young people in ocean conservation and advocacy through the arts. So Bow Seat programs focus on the arts because we believe that creative expression and imagination are powerful ways to help students learn about and connect with the environment and also tools to make visible and to communicate the threats to our ocean and ultimately inspire people to come together to care for our planet. Bow Seat's largest educational program is the Ocean Awareness Contest which invites middle and high school students from around the world to explore and communicate through visual art, 
writing, film, multimedia, and music, how human activities impact the health of our ocean. And since 2012, more than 13,000 teams from all 50 US states and 106 countries have participated. And we've awarded more than $300,000 in um, scholarships to young people in our programs. And more than an art contest, we've heard from our students over the years that participating increases their knowledge of the ocean. It builds a sense of community with others who care and are concerned about climate change um, and other issues uh, facing our ocean. Um, and it increases their confidence in communication and creative skills. But most importantly, um, creating art personally and emotionally connects them to these conservation topics. So we see that this creative experience changes their worldview and often increases um, what we consider to be pro-environmental um, behaviors. So as many of you might know, 2017 was a particularly bad year for North Atlantic right whales with um, 17 confirmed dead from entanglement and ship strikes. And um, to clarify, this video is referencing 2017. So on a hopeful note, we have seen, um, I believe, 10 right whale births this year, and we'll get more into that later in this webinar. Um, but in the spring of 2018, Bausi began, began conversations with uh, Conservation Law Foundation about how our organizations might collaborate to increase uh, the visibility of the plight of the endangered right whale and also provide opportunities for local youth and their families to take action and speak up about this issue. So the goal for this collaboration was really to leverage the power of the arts, creative media and storytelling to promote um, intergenerational conversation and engagement in ocean conservation actions and also to um, inspire public support for research and science-based regulations that protect our coastal ecosystems and our whales. And the outcome of these conversations was the Healthy Whale, Healthy Ocean Challenge, which invited uh, K through 12 students from the New England and Gulf of Maine regions in the US and Canada to create visual art, poetry, and short films that celebrate the right whale and inspire action for its protection. So to kick off the challenge, we curated a collection of online learning resources for classrooms and for students to learn about the biology of whales, uh, their connection to the maritime history of our region, uh, the whales' important, importance to marine ecosystems, and how the right whale's decline po points to larger threats that are facing our ocean today, um, including the impacts of climate change, um, increasing industrialization and pollution. So more than 130 young people ranging in age from six to 18 um, created artwork and poetry and short films for the Healthy Well Challenge. And um, our teams were really just so moved by these, not only the young artist's skill, but also their compassion and their enthusiasm for protecting marine life. And I'm really pleased to share a selection of their works with you all. And I will um, speak briefly about the general themes that came up through the students' um, artistic responses. And as we go through, um, and we'll go through a couple of the pieces where I'm not um, speaking. But if you're interested in revisiting the artwork for longer or sharing it with friends, you can um, visit our website at healthywhale.org and view and share these pieces. So uh, I'll start with this gorgeous sculpture called Public Awareness, which um, is actually quite large. It's about a foot, a uh, foot and a half or two in length, and it's covered in uh, local headlines about the right whale that were transferred onto the ceramic body. And this piece um, really blew away the bow seat and CLF teams away, as well as our team of guest judges, which uh, included Brian Scarry, who is a National Geographic um, photojournalist who has covered uh, North Atlantic right whales and their cousins in the South, um, Dr. Moira Brown, a research scientist at the Canadian Whale Institute, and uh, David Abel, who's a reporter for the Boston Globe and a documentary filmmaker who also covers the right whale beat. And in addition to doing the artwork, students submitted written reflections about what they learned through the creative process. So you'll see snippets from these reflections uh, with each artwork on the right side of the screen. Um, and nearly across the board, students wrote about how they were learning about right whales for the first time. And so not just that the, the whales are critically endangered or facts about their biology, um, but that they existed at all. 
And there was also this real recognition that although humans are responsible for the plight of right whales, our, action, uh, our actions can help save them. So we'll go through a couple of pieces now and I'll let you kind of just um, look and appreciate. So many of the young artists reflected on their personal role as um, active caretakers of not only our human communities, but also our non-human communities. And they wrote about what actions they would take now that they were aware of this issue. Um, the primary one being that they would continue to spread awareness and tell others that they need to care about this issue. So many were acknowledging this sense of agency to speak up for our oceans and the incredible life um, that we have below the surface. And you can see in their works that they imagine and consider the animal lives that whales lead and the families they have. And, and, and in some pieces, you can really feel how they're reckoning with ideas of loss and not only in the sense of biodiversity, but what it might actually feel like to a whale to lose its kin. But this empathy for the natural world and particularly for wildlife is what's really exciting to me um, because it illustrates this care and compassion that's woven into imagination and creation and uh, research shows that empathy towards wildlife is an important factor in predicting uh, an individual's willingness to take conservation action. So we hope that um, this conservation ethic continues to build over time for all of these young people. And again, we'll um, go through some of their artwork. So all of our healthy whale participants and uh, their families were recognized at an award ceremony during the Right Whale Festival last spring, which we co-hosted with Conservation Law Foundation and the New England Aquarium. And um, more than 400 people came out for this public celebration, which featured an art exhibit and film screenings and youth presentations and a panel discussion. Um, and it was a really special celebration of not only our right whales, but the incredible community working to protect the health of the whale and the health of our ocean. So I want to end there on that hopeful note, thinking about this uh, generation, next generation of whale advocates, and also with a lot of gratitude for 
the important and amazing work that's being done by my fellow colleagues here who are speaking tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, so tonight's roadshow is virtual, but we actually hosted two other Right Whale Roadshows, one in Portland, Maine, and one in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Um, and we originally intended to host this one in person. Um, and as part of those shows, so we partnered with Conservation Law Foundation um, and Bowsey Ocean Awareness Programs to use their amazing artwork. But we also did a call for art for local artists. And so this evening, I wanted to highlight just a couple of those images. Um, so you'll see those on the next few slides. This piece is by artist Jim Dupre of Hampton, New Hampshire, and he used um, acrylic to create these two pieces. And you can read his reflection and I'll give you a couple moments to view the artwork and then we'll move on to the next one. And these two pieces were created by artist Anna Dibble in Portland, Maine. Um, she actually created them on slate, which is a really unique background for a composition. And then she had a pretty beautiful reflection, um, the story of the North Atlantic right whale and its difficult search in the warm Gulf of Maine for Kalanis. Its favorite food is a perfect metaphor for the human climate change refugees of our planet. And finally, um, we had this beautiful piece by Kim LaFrance of Seabrook, New Hampshire. This is actually not Kim in the photo. Um, it's an attendee at one of our other right whale road shows in Portland. Um, but she actually had the experience of seeing a right whale and it inspired her to create this um, amazing mixed media piece. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we had planned to host a series of the three White Whale art shows across New England. And next we are going to hear from uh, Ashley Stokes, who works for the Seacoast Science Center as the Marine Mammal Rescue Manager. Great, thank you, Michaela. Uh, and thank you to my fellow panelists and to all of you for joining us today, wherever you may be viewing from. It's certainly not the same as being in person, but Hopefully we can also reach kind of a, a broader audience um, than we would have been limited to hosting in New Hampshire. Uh, but as Michael mentioned, um, my name is Ashley Stokes. I run our Marine Mammal Rescue Program at Seco Science Center. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with the Science Center, we're a nonprofit uh, marine science museum and we're located in Rye, New Hampshire. Uh, and we're actually located within a historic uh, state park called Odierne Point, which is right on the ocean front. Um, so it's certainly a beautiful location. And though uh, the Science Center has been in existence since 92, uh, our marine animal rescue program began in 2014. Um, and personally, I've been at the Science Center um, approaching 16 years now. Uh, so I've got to see this transition uh, from starting the program to where we are now. Uh, which is very exciting uh, to be able to do. So those of you that don't know what we do, I'm just here a little bit. Uh, and we'll certainly start with the whales, but um, marine mammals, for those who don't know, are federally protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, and that act was passed in 1972. Uh, so our response program is staffed with uh, two full-timers, a couple of part-timers, as well as a consulting veterinarian. Uh, that we talk through all of our cases with anytime we have a question on live animals. Um, but we also, and quite frankly, could not do this work without them. We utilize approximately 34 uh, dedicated field responder volunteers who play a vital role in helping us to respond to all of the animals in the field. Uh, so our response is from Essex, Massachusetts. So, one quick, yeah. one quick question. This is Michaela. Your audio is coming in a bit garbled. Hmm. Let me try to take my headphones off. Is that better? Yes, much better. Okay. Um, so our response territory starts in Essex, Massachusetts and runs northward to the main border. 
Uh, and in an average year, we respond to about 115 different animal cases. Uh, so certainly we have a seasonality that peaks in the summertime, but also coincides with the beach season. Uh, but in 2018, we had what's referred to as an unusual mortality event in seals, which led us to close down the year uh, with 208 animal cases. So again, just back how important our volunteers are when they go to full-time staff to be able to get in the field. So as part of our work, we uh, host a 24-hour reporting hotline so that people can re report any live or dead marine animal that they come across in the territory. Um, and that includes not only those forests, but dolphins, whales, and porpoises. Um, we also sometimes will get calls for animals other than those species listed, um, but we do call all of our callers back and help them route to the appropriate agency if they're calling about something other than a marine mammal. So we handle all of the response for these animals, but of course is on a case by case basis. Um, so we talk, talk through them, um, not only with what we call seal side conversations on the beach, but we also talk to the public through school programs, public programs, et cetera. We collect data on all of those animals and go into a database which is handled by National Marine Fisheries. And it's utilized not only by our own agencies and organizations that do this work, but it's also utilized by researchers studying various topics. Um, so certainly right whales would fall into that as well, um, into that database. And we're also, for those of you not on the northern east coast that are tuning in, we're also part of a greater network of responders um, that's called the Greater Atlantic Response Network. Our network runs mainly through Virginia, but there's also some agencies in all other states with the ocean coastline. So wherever you might find a right now, there's a trained responder local who can help you out. So the photos you see on your screen now um, depict some of what we do when we need to intervene with animals. Seals encompass about 90% of what we do each year, um, but we do also get all the hand whales. Uh, of course. After all you know, the dolphins, whales, and porpoises should not be sure if they're alive. So most of what we deal with in those species are deceased animals. So from those animals, we take a host of different measurements, morphometric data, et cetera, uh, to go into that database. And on some animals, they do require internal as well. So the photos you're seeing on the screen now is typical of what we would get if we got a call on the hotline about a whale. We haven't, since our program started, knock on wood, had a deceased uh, right whale come up on shore. But in 2016, in June, we did have this uh, juvenile humpback whale named Snowplow that washed ashore in Rye, um, right next to a state park just before 4th of July weekend. Uh, so that's Kind of what we have to deal with are a couple of very slightly graphic photos um, on this slide in the next, but I'm not too graphic, so I hope all the listeners are okay with that. Um, but when we do an internal examination on a deceased animal and we collect all of these samples, in some cases it can help us determine what led to the animal demise if it's not evident externally. Uh, if we get a smaller animal for a whale, we might get something like a minke whale, um, but this was our biggest animal to date. So though we've never had a right whale on shore in our territory since the inception of the program, we do occasionally get called in for mutual aid, um, which is where my experience with right whales has occurred. So also in the summer of 2016, um, close to when we were dealing with our comeback whale on shore, we were requested by our partners just to the north of us uh, in southern Maine, uh, they're called Marine Mammals of Maine, to assist with the examination uh, post-mortem exam on a whale. This animal was towed to a boat ramp. It was first reported offshore, was loaded onto a flatbed truck, and then was transported um, to an undisclosed location at the time um, to for the postmortem exam, but also simultaneously the area where the animal would then be composted after the exam was complete. So even though for this animal in particular, uh, externally it was pretty obvious that it had long-term trauma 
from entanglement, which we're seeing a lot of these days, unfortunately, in fisheries gear. And this not only impacted the front flippers, but it also wrapped in and out of the mouth and the baleen of this animal. And some of the line wraps were so tightly bound that they had cut deeply into the flesh. And the degree in which this animal was entangled uh, would have made it extremely difficult and painful for this animal to not only swim, but to consume meals as well. But for some cases, it's not as evident externally, but I mentioned why internal exams are extremely important. And even if they're upward signs of trauma, it's important to look at the animal internally to see if it also had anything else that was going on underlying. Uh, so samples are always taken and analyzed uh, to help biologists to determine what led to the demise of any animal in question. So I ask all of you uh, listening tonight, just to wrap things up, to take home one key piece of information uh, that I shared with you all today. If you do ever come across a live or deceased animal, where do whales are smaller? Please be sure to keep a distance of at least 150 feet. Just remember that they're all federally protected and report it to your local marine animal response agency so we can send the number up. And I thank you all for listening. Great. Thank you, Ashley. That's some really helpful observations and great um, context to have. I do want to apologize for any audio issue issues for anyone who is listening and also experiencing that. Um, it could have been a connection issue or something along those lines, but um, hopefully you were able to hear most of, most of her stories. For me, it just happened you know, on occasion. Um, and she will also have more time to answer questions for anything that you might have missed during the question and answer portion of the evening. Um, so now we are going to hear more about the behaviors and features of right whales from Heather Pettis, Associate Scientist um, of Right Whale Research at the New England Aquarium. Thanks, Michaela. Um, uh, again, my name is Heather Pettis and I am a researcher with the Right Whale Research Program at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium in Boston, Mass. Um, I'm really happy to take part in this virtual panel um, and excited for the opportunity to share a little bit about how I became involved in this research and tell you a bit about this um, amazing species. It's always interesting to me to understand how people begin their careers. And for me, um, I was in graduate school in the late 1990s uh, in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and connected with folks at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center who were doing uh, right whale aerial surveys over the Great South Channel, uh, which is an area east of Cape Cod. You can see it sort of circled in that black circle in the top left. Um, and so I had the opportunity to, to join these aerial surveys. And on one of my first flights, we came across this right whale who was entangled at the time. Um, and you can see the trailing line and a buoy um, coming back behind them. And, it was heartbreaking for me to see um, an animal this large struggling a bit to swim um, with, with all of this line dragging behind. Um, and it was really a motivating seeing this and experiencing seeing right whales in the wild um, in this heartbreaking event was a motivating factor for me uh, to pursue right whale research and conservation. And um, I've been studying the right the research program. Um, at the aquarium for nearly 20 years now. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the species, I've highlighted um, one uh, picture of one in uh, with this yellow arrow. Um, it's one of the great large whales of the world. And while not quite as large as blue whales or fin whales, they are in fact quite large um, and can reach 50 plus feet and weigh 60 plus tons. They are somewhat odd looking, they lack a dorsal fin, um, and they have these really unique roughened raised patches of skin in various places on their heads. The history of the North Atlantic right whale is a really interesting one, and, and I think um, one that history buffs get <clears throat> some a kick out of, of hearing and understanding. So right whales were named as such. Um, for a few reasons, but one of which was because they were the right whales to hunt. They're relatively slow, they're 
found quite close to shore um, at certain periods of time in the, in the year, and they yield large amounts of blubber and plates of mouth baleen compared to other whales. And so all of this made them really easy targets and quite profitable. Um, so right whales were hunted longer than any other whale species, both in the eastern and western uh, North Atlantic Ocean. The species was protected internationally in the 1930s, and at this time, really very little was known about the population status. Researchers doing um, some acoustic work in Cape Cod Bay in the 1950s documented a handful of right whales occupying that habitat. But it wasn't until systematic surveys began in the 1980s that we started to understand the distribution and the status of the population. Um, and this population has been really closely monitored uh, ever since the early 1980s. So in terms of distribution, um, <clears throat> North Atlantic right whales range from the southeastern U.S. coast to the Canadian Maritimes. And you can see their generalized range here. We do occasionally get um, some weird travels. One thing that's been in the news quite recently is there was a mom and calf pair sighted. Um, they sort of dipped around the Florida Keys and went into the Gulf of Mexico for a little bit, um, caused some excitement. There, they have made it back around and were sighted a couple of days ago off the coast of North Carolina. Um, so the critical habitats in the U.S. include this calving ground off the coast of Florida and Georgia, and then northern feeding grounds in the northeast, including Cape Cod Bay and Massachusetts Bay. And we do sometimes see right whales off the coast of New Hampshire out by the Isle of Shoals. Um, although most of these important habitats were discovered in the 1980s and earlier. Additional habitats have been discovered in more recent years, including areas south of Cape Cod um, uh, in the islands, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, um, and then also the Gulf of St. Lawrence, this area um, just um, east of New Brunswick, Canada. We can bump ahead a little bit. So one, one important thing to point out is these newly discovered habitats um, are likely being used by right whales because of a shift in their prey resource. Um, we know that the Gulf of Maine is warm, those, those waters are warming faster than um, most places, most bodies of, of water on earth. And so that has real impacts for their prey resource, these Calanus copepods. Um, and so the shifting distribution of that prey resource is what is um, driving primarily the shift in distribution that we've seen for right whales over the last handful of years. So one of the things that we do at the aquarium, um, and we have been on the forefront of for over 40 years, um, is the use of individual identification in telling right whales apart. So each individual right whale possesses raised patches of skin on the head, um, and so the cursor is sort of showing you those. Here you have two right whales with their heads sticking out of the water, and you're looking down at the top of the heads. Um, these patches emerge within the first year of a right whale's life, and they remain relatively constant over time, and so we can use those patterns to tell right whales apart. And in collaboration with um, other North Atlantic right whale consortium partners, which I'll speak about in a bit, the aquarium team curates the right whale identification catalog. And so this includes all photograph sightings of right whales taken from 1935 to present. Um, it includes almost 80,000 sightings of right whales. We have um, in the catalog over 750 individual right whales that we've been able to identify. Not all of them are alive, um, but we know that this population has had 750 plus individuals, and the catalog right now contains nearly a million photographs of right whales. Um, so one of the really fascinating things to me that we can do using these individual identifications and um, the longevity of this program, studying this really small population for 40 years, we have gotten to know individual whales really, really well. And so we can look at not only the individual whale, but their entire families, and we develop these family trees. So this is an example of a female, 1140, who's an old female, 
Um, some whales have names. This whale's name um, is Wart, and she was named because her callosity pattern um, reminded researchers of warts, and it um, was something that when they saw her in the field, they would um, sort of, her name would click in their heads and they'd be able to recognize her really quickly. Um, so she's been a really, really important uh, whale in this population. She's given birth to seven calves of her own, and she has 13 grand calves and six great grand calves. So it's females like wart um, with these long and, and successful reproductive spans that are vital to the success and survival of this population. So unfortunately, um, as many of you are aware, the North Atlantic right whale population is um, in real trouble. And one thing that's really important for me to convey is that when you hear the right whale population, we are talking about a species. This is an entire species represented by this small population. Um, between 2000 and 2010, the North Atlantic right whale saw promising population growth rates of almost 3%. Um, and we had a, a max population that hovered just under 500. Um, since that time, however, the population has been in decline, and we estimated in 2018 there to be 409 animals uh, left in the population. The population decline is explained by simple math. There are more whales dying than there are being born. Um, we have had, over the last three years, 30 known deaths, and we think that we are only documenting maybe 40% of actual deaths. So this, the, the real mortality number is quite higher than that. We have had 22 calves born over the last four seasons, which there were 10 calves born this, this year, which is great. We should be seeing 30 calves born each year. Um, and most concerning is this number of potential mothers. We think there are fewer than 100 reproductive females remaining in the population. Um, so, so that is sort of the depressing side, and it is the reality facing, facing the species. But what gives me and other right whale researchers hope is the commitment to saving the species through unparalleled collaboration. This species, this population, is one of the most well-studied whale species in the world. Over 40 years, research, conservation, and management has been defined by collaboration. Um, that's been largely facilitated by this amazing um, group called the North Atlantic Right Whale uh, Consortium. The consortium is overseen by researchers at the aquarium, but it includes over 200 individuals and in organizations, um, from field biologists to acousticians to fishermen to members of the shipping industry to government officials in both the U.S. and Canada, and even poop, uh, whale poop sniffing dogs. Um, <clears throat> So each of these members, in, including this Pop Fargo, um, are committed to working together to advance the science through data sharing, which you don't often see in science. Um, so, so sharing data and, and integrating research collaborations, our ultimate mission is to ensure the survival and the recovery of this, of this whale. And so this group is, is spectacular. There's a website here um, if you want to learn more about the consortium or about right whales and all the, the groups doing really great work, you can check that out. Um, and then the last bit I want to say is that in addition to this um, collaborative group, this consortium, the public is absolutely vital to our efforts. So thank you for your interest. And in the end, it will take you all, the public, being good stewards and advocates of the planet and her oceans, that's what's going to save this species. So now that we've learned why right whales are so special, thank you, Heather, for that presentation, we'll hear from Erica Fuller, senior attorney at Conservation Law Foundation, about her work to keep right whales safe and protect the species. Thanks, Michaela, and, and everyone um, for the opportunity to be here tonight. It's, it's really an honor. Um, my interest in right whales started almost 30 years ago when I was hiking along the coast um, in Nova Scotia, and I heard a sound that I'd never heard before. And about 20 feet from me um, in the water, I saw sort of the V-shaped spout of a right whale. I was a large animal veterinarian at the time, and I'd worked on some pretty big animals, including elephants, but I'd never seen anything as massive as this whale. Um, 
although the species has been protected under the uh, Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act since the early 70s, right whales remain designated as endangered primarily because of entanglements in commercial fishing gear and ship strikes. But as you can see from this picture right here, there's also uh, noise um, that, that is increasingly becoming an issue. As Heather mentioned, the, the population was rebuilding until around 2010, but it's been on a nosedive since that time. And in addition to ship strikes uh, and entanglements, um, certain fisheries started to change their fishing practices in response to increasing ocean water temperatures. And uh, in many cases, they moved offshore, started to use heavier gear and, and thicker ropes. So, so that now when right whales are entangled, if, if they don't manage to break free, they either drown immediately or drag that gear around for months and sometimes even years. And the energetic costs of this entanglement to those fewer than 100 females means that we've got a lot fewer calves being born and longer intervals between those calves. Um, this slide shows the overlap between the migratory route that um, some parts of the population take and the potential threats along the way. Because we can't successfully tag right whales, we usually don't know where the majority of the population is. Um, the figure on the left shows where most pregnant females go to calve in the winter down in off the coast of Florida and Georgia, and where most of the population now feeds in the summer in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. But in order to do that migration, not only must they navigate beyond like major ports and shipping lanes, as well as fishing gear that goes the whole length, but um, as the slide on the right shows, they do face an increasingly uh, noisy ocean due to offshore wind farms that um, interfere with, that, that noise will eventually interfere with their ability to communicate unless it's mitigated. Um, essentially, any vertical line in the water column that connects something weighted to the bottom to a buoy on the surface poses a risk to right whales. It's, it's estimated that there's more than a million lines in their migratory and feeding routes in the U.S. alone. This right whale was first seen entangled in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in August of 2018, and that's its baleen protruding on the left-hand side there. Um, but as bad as it looks, there were gear-free sightings of this whale in December of that same year, which is truly remarkable. Uh, the species is highly dependent upon dense patches of copepods about the size of a rice kernel for food and they, they tend to move very slowly along the surface when feeding, making them very difficult to spot even under the best of sea conditions and particularly prone to ship strikes. So CLF's camp, Right Whale Campaign has um, been a multi-pronged approach, which includes these five elements, litigation, mitigation, legislation, education, and collaboration. And, and first, with respect to litigation, after uh, an unprecedented number of deaths in 2017, we filed two lawsuits against the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, Michaela, I think you can advance one slide. Uh, it's worth it's worth noting that um, the National Marine Fisheries Service has an inherent conflict of interest. It's charged both by with protecting right whales and with authorizing the, fi the fisheries, some of which um, kill whales. And so our, our first lawsuit challenged the ongoing authorization of the lobster fishery in the absence of sufficient protections, including an incidental take permit. Um, this case was consolidated with another suit filed by um, other ENGOs, including Center for Biological Diversity, Defenders of Wildlife, and the Humane Society. And um, we just heard a few hours ago that we did win this decision. Um, our second lawsuit was a challenge to NIMS's decision to open up more than 3,000 square miles of important right whale foraging habitat in southern New England to expanded gillnet fishing. And back in October, um, we won this lawsuit um, on all counts. Uh, citing Moby Dick, the judge agreed that um, the appropriate remedy was to restore prohibitions on gillnet fishing and NIMS has reclosed those areas until further notice. 
On offshore wind mitigation, CLF has collaborated with its partners, um, Natural Resources Defense Council and the National Wildlife Federation and um, developers, including Vineyard Wind, which is the farthest along in the permitting process to solidify an agreement that will be used in other projects. And the mitigation measures um, recommended include uh, seasonal restrictions on construction, enhanced monitoring, vessel speed restrictions, and the use of um, new noise attenuation technologies when right whales are there or expected to be present. With respect to legislation, um, we've worked with several partners to obtain uh, bipartisan support for the Save the Right Whales Act, which would authorize $6 million a year for 10 years to develop, test, and implement new technologies. Um, efforts to advance ropeless fishing systems could receive um, some much necessary funding if this bill passes. And it is critical that fishermen are part of the solution. It's their livelihood and they have the expertise to make necessary gear modifications that ensure their crews are safe. Um, lobstermen in most states, including New Hampshire, have already implemented several measures recommended by the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Team, which they also participate on, including the use of um, things like sinking ground line and placing additional traps on a trawl, but, but there is more work to be done in the future. Um, one of the promising new technologies is ropeless or buoyless uh, fishing. and the next picture, if you can advance it, Michaela, um, shows, shows one type. Um, there's either a buoy or a lift bag is stowed on the bottom of the ocean floor and it pops up when it receives an acoustic signal from the vessel. And afterwards, the lobsterman can retrieve his traps using traditional fishing practices. Um, this technology, from our perspective, would protect both jobs in the fishery and right whales. And we've collaborated with several partners to try to streamline the permitting process and get appropriate gear into the hands of fishermen. Um, we will, like others on the call, continue to push for um, solutions to save right whales, including the establishment of um, new protected areas, the testing and adoption of ropeless fishing gear, mandatory speed restrictions, um, increased monitoring, and smart offshore wind development. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Erica. And now we'll move into the Q&A portion of the evening. So you can click the chat function um, to ask questions to the panel, and then I'll read them out loud as they come in. Um, so this one is a question for Alyssa, and it is from Andrea, and she is curious to know if there is some research that you're referring to um, when you mentioned that growing empathy is key to the conservation ethic. Alyssa, do you want to talk a little bit more about empathy and conservation ethic and um, shed some Yeah, I, well, I shared uh, the resource um, privately to uh, Andrea, but the um, Seattle Aquarium has a really great uh, document that's called Best Practices in Developing Empathy Toward Wildlife. Um, and it, that has a ton of additional um, research and resources in there. So I would recommend um, that to learn more about those uh, particular kinds of connections. Awesome. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, the next question that we have is, how can we educate our local lobstermen about new gear? Um, Erica, do you want to maybe start with this? I know that, and then maybe Heather can hop in. I know that you both have worked with lobstermen. Sure. Um, I, most local lobstermen um, have an association that they belong to, and their associations have done not only did they participate on the take reduction team, um, which has been given a lot of this information, but they've also had um, conversations with manufacturers and um, other people promoting this sort of road to ropeless. So I, I feel like the the communication lines are are pretty open in terms of available information, um, and certainly if um, they want to contact us, we would be happy to put them in touch with 
um, manufacturers that might be appropriate for the depths they fish in or um, the areas where they fish. Thank you, Erica. Um, and this question also goes to Heather too, so I'll add it on, but um, someone was wondering why right whales can't be tagged. And this is Heather. I'll tag. I, I just I want to add one bit to the um, the last question as well. There are um, many uh, researchers who are engaged with fishermen. So well, it, we have researchers at the aquarium. There are researchers at Woods Hole Oceanographic um, who are working with local fishermen um, to test these various new technologies, um, both for ropeless and reduced breaking strength ropes. Um, so the, the communication with re, between researchers and lobstermen is, is ongoing, um, primarily through those associations that um, Erica mentioned. Um, the tagging question is a, is a, is a good one. Um, there are several reasons we, we don't and can't tag right whales. Um, one of the, the biggest is there, these are really, um, tactile whales and they engage in a lot of um, physical rolling and touching and they often um, come up to the surface with mud on their head indicating that they're banging into the sea floor. Um, and so to have a tag that will remain on a whale for any uh, length of time that will yield information that's useful uh, requires the tag to be pretty deeply embedded. Um, there have been tags that have attempted this in the past and the, the impact on health that we saw um, was disturbing. There are swellings, um, open wounds, and so that's not something that we want to subject an endangered species to. Um, that's the primary reason. Um, even if we tagged every whale in the population, which is logistically impossible, um, knowing where they are at all times would be um, an ideal situation to have. Um, but looking at the uh, effect of the tags to transmit and getting that information to the people who would need them, it's, it's not logistically possible. Um, and so tagging, um, long-term tagging is, is not something that we uh, recommend or would support at this time. Thank you, Heather. Um, so we have a couple questions here about ropeless fishing gear. Um, so one of them is how widespread is the use of on-call lobster equipment in our waters right now and what extra expenses are involved? And then another similar question is um, how many of these acoustic buoys have been tested? Um, and I think maybe Erica um, would be able to best speak to this. Sure, I can start and then maybe Heather has something she'd like to add, but um, currently no one in the United States is fishing with this kind of technology. It's just in the testing phase. It has been tested uh, for the last several summers. Um, different manufacturer bring um, uh, sort of different size cages, different uh, methods of retrieving the trap. Um, there are probably six or seven manufacturers at this point in time that are testing in the US and Canada. So, um, but no one is actively fishing with it in, as their only means of fishing for lobster at this time. Um, it is, uh, you know, uh, something that um, the cost will hopefully come down as there are economies of scale and as um, manufacturers produce more and more of these units. Um, we are also pushing hard for federal legislation to help with funding and there are, there are some private foundations helping with funding. So at this point in time, it's not something that's commercially feasible for all lobstermen to go out and immediately transition to, but that is, that is the hope if it turns out with appropriate testing that it looks like, you know, it will be successful at, in, in various areas depending upon the depth of the water fished or the tides or the currents that um, occur in those places, there may be some areas that are more, more appropriate for 
uh, ropeless fishing than others, but um, it's important to keep in mind that every single vertical line poses a risk to right whales. So to the extent we can eliminate any of them, it's really important. Great, thank you, Erica. Heather, did you have anything you wanted to add there? No, that was a pretty um, thorough summary. I, I did see, I guess I'll throw in here the um, sort of stopgap measure that we have um, been working to test and support is in, in the time that it does take for the ropeless technology to be tested and um, permitted and the cost to come down there are um, intermediate measures that would not prevent whales from becoming entangled, but would likely reduce the severity and lethality of those entanglements. Um, and that is the use of re reduced breaking strength rope for vertical lines. And so these are ropes that are not as strong as what many lobster um, and um, crab pot fishers use now, um, and the idea is that if a whale is entangled, that they can more easily break free, and um, the result being less severe injuries and, and um, fewer mortalities. Great, thank you, Heather, for shedding a little bit more light on some of what's been happening in that realm over the last several years. Um, another question that we have is about uh, their, their food sources. So it was mentioned in the presentation that uh, these whales feed on copepods, specifically colonists, um, and someone would like to know if anyone is monitoring changes in the colonist populations in local waters, um, because they have heard that in some areas around the world, copepod populations have been declining. Um, Heather, this might be another good one for you. Yeah, yeah there, there are a couple um, Gulf of Maine research Institute does a lot of copepod monitoring. There are Canadian researchers who um, monitor copepod uh, abundance and densities in the Bay of Fundy and in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We have uh, a researcher at the New England Aquarium who looks at not only, um, his work is really interesting because he's, he's looking not just at um, the, the amount of copepods or the densities, but the timing. So that's been a really interesting aspect to, to look at is we're seeing earlier blooms in phytoplankton, um, which is what um, these copepods <coughs> feed on and other zooplankton species. And so you're seeing an earlier bloom um, in, in zooplankton and also shifting um, distributions of these plankton. So and, and I had, did mention in my short presentation that that's one of the reasons we think that whales are shifting their distribution is in response to not only shifting distributions in prey, um, but also it seems that the prey quality has decreased over time. These copepods store large amounts of um, fat and, and lipids, and that's what these right whales are, are after. And it seems that the copepods that have been tested in over the last couple of years are not as lipid rich as they have historically been. Um, so that poses trouble for the right whale. So not only are they having to seek out new places to feed, uh, the food that they're feeding on is not as uh, nutritional as it should be. Thank you, Heather. So I know we are at time right now. Um, and so I wanted to let people know how to take an action to protect right whales. And incidentally, that's something that has come up a lot in the questions. Um, so I am going to chat out this link, but um, as you've heard this evening, you know, right whales are really amazing creatures and hopefully you've gained an understanding of why they're so special and why we should work to keep them in our oceans. Um, so now you'll have the opportunity to help save right whales. Um, Erica mentioned this, but the Save Right Whales Act is a bill in Congress that would protect right whales, help protect right whales. It's a you know, multi-pronged effort um, by devoting funds to the development of ropeless fishing technology. Um, and you know, ropeless fishing would really protect them because fishing entanglements are one of the most major threats to right whales. So I am going to chat out this link, um, which will take you to a portal where you can write a message directly to your elected official and ask them to support the Save Right Whales Act. Um, once you click this link, you'll be prompted to submit 
with what state you live in, and then um, you'll be able to draft your own message or submit the one that we've already drafted, and it will go straight to your Saturday. So hold on one minute, and I will chat out this link. Um, you can also, you know, type it into your into your web browser, but that takes a little bit of finagling, so this is probably easiest. And I have just sent it out. Um, and then if panelists want to stick around for a couple more minutes and answer questions, um, we can we can do that. And if we aren't able to get to your questions too, I'll make sure um, to email some responses out tomorrow. Great, so a couple of our panelists are able to stick around and answer a few more questions. Um, so I can give that about five, five or 10 more minutes. Um, and one question that was just asked um, from someone named Olivia is what is the natural lifespan of a, of a whale? Um, so Heather, you might be able I'll to- I'll take it. <laughs> sure, so the, the quick answer is we don't actually know. So they are long lived and we've only been studying them for about 40 years. So um, we haven't uh, nearly approached what we believe to be their potential lifespan. The, the, and unfortunately, many whales are, are dying before they hit that um, lifespan. But a really interesting um, piece of evidence that we have is from a sighting of a mom and a calf off the coast of Florida in 1935. Um, a, uh, a fisherman was hunting the calf and a, um, a photographer, a journalist happened to be on board and took a photograph of the mom and the calf. And the calf was killed and the, the mom um, was able to get away. We have another photograph of that same female that we were able to match to the 1935 photograph from the 1950s. And then she was seen again in the 70s and her last sighting was seen in 1995. At that point, she had a very large ship strike wound to her head and she was never seen again. So we have a sighting history of 60 years for her. And in 1935, she had a calf most females become reproductively active around nine or 10 years of age, but we have seen uh, a couple of females give birth at five years old. So if we say she was at the young age uh, of five in 1935, that puts her at 65 years of age when she was hit by this ship and presumably died. So at least 65 years, probably closer to 80 or so, they're, uh, relatively closely related to the bowhead whale, which we know can live um, 100 to 150 years old, maybe even more than that. Um, so that's a, that's a long, cool story to say. We don't know, but they can live a lot old, uh, longer than um, we are allowing them to live. Great, thank you for that context. Um, another question that we have is, um, that, and this is another one for you, Heather. Heather um, could you speak a little bit more about the um, measuring stress hormones in the female right whale species? And do you know um, if this research ultimately proved that females are stressed and less fertile? Uh, sure. Uh, so we have, as part of, um, we have a marine stress and ocean health program at the New England Aquarium. And Dr. Rosalind Rollin pioneered using right whale feces to um, look at reproductive hormones, uh, stress hormones. And so what she has found in, in a variety of, of research um, projects is we can detect fluctuations in right whale stress hormones. Um, and we can also detect pregnancy in, in right whales. 
Um, whether there, I, I don't believe that we have a link directly to um, increased stress hormones and failed reproductive output of, of right whales. I don't think our sample size is quite big enough. But what we do have is evidence of lost pregnancies. So we um, females who tested uh, were pregnant based on hormone analysis and did not show up and give birth. Um, we also can see direct links to anthropogenic stress um, in, in terms of entanglements in the elevation of stress hormones detected. And we know just based on general mammalian physiology, the impact of stress on reproductive output. Um, so it's an ongoing, it's ongoing work um, out of the, the New England Aquarium Lab that um, will undoubtedly shed more light on the links between anthropogenic injury, um, general stress, and reproductive output in the population. Thank you. Um, so up next, the question that we have is, what is the main cause of such a drastic decrease in population size in the last decade? And why do you think the death rates are outweighing the birth rates? Um, trying to think. Maybe we can have Erica start off on this and then Heather follow. Yeah, I think the two um, primary causes for the um, declines are both ship strikes and entanglements. But what we think changed in 2010 is that the sublethal effects of, I mean, 85% of right whales have a scar on them that they've had some kind of entanglement. So most of the time they're breaking free. But for however long they drag that gear around or have a piece of a line caught in their baleen so they can't feed appropriately, it takes a toll on them. And so we're just not, in addition to a lot of deaths, we're not seeing the calves that we used to see. I think Heather said earlier that we, you know, we used to see on average 25 to 30 calves a year. And that's really what we need again in order to rebuild this population and take it out of this kind of sink that it's in right now. And, and I'll add that's exactly right. I mean, the anthropogenic injury is the number one, that's what's killing right whales. There was a paper that was just published last year. Of, um, all of the, between 2003 and 2018, uh, there wasn't a single juvenile or adult right whale that died from a natural cause when the cause of death could be determined. Every death was attributed to ship strike or entanglement. Um, so, and we, we've seen an increase in those deaths over the last handful of years. The failure, the reproductive failure is probably, um, it's certainly complex. It's, it's likely a combination of um, shifting prey resources and whales having to travel farther to find food and, and perhaps the food is not as nutritionally high as it, it has historically been. But we also know that even if entanglements don't kill an animal, the amount of energy expended in overcoming the drag of the line and the gear, and also the energy expended in recovering from the injury, which is oftentimes quite severe, um, that energetic drain prevents females from getting pregnant and carrying uh, offspring to term. Um, so the good news is we have no doubt that, that this species can recover. If we give them time, if we stop killing them, they can figure out where food is and they can fatten up and, and have babies. Um, the problem right now is we're not giving them enough breathing room and time to make those adjustments. They're very resilient. If we could back off and give them some time to reset, find food, get fat, and get pregnant. Thanks, Heather. So I'm mindful of time. So I think we'll just take one to two more questions. Um, and this next question actually dovetails nicely with the idea of um, some time and space. But so um, Andrea would like to know, during this time of COVID-19, there's less shipping traffic moving through the waters. And do you think um, that there will be any change that will be noticed afterwards about whale behavior from data collected during this time? And probably Heather is a good person to speak to that. Sure. So it's, an, it's a really interesting question. Do, I, I think that all of 
nature is is breathing a sigh of relief that um, there's not as much human activity right now. Um, there, you know, a lot of research programs are sort of in a holding pattern, so many of us are not out on the water um, right now. But what I can say is that we have direct evidence that decreased shipping activity um, almost immediately reduces stress hormones in right whales. Um, and that came out of a study in the Bay of Fundy after 9-11 when we happened to be measuring acoustic um, noise levels in the Bay of Fundy and we were also doing uh, hormone analyses for feces both before and after 9-11 and um, thought many years later to compare before and after stress hormone levels um, before 9-11 and then after 9-11 when all shipping uh, in the Bay of Fundy stopped and it was nearly an immediate decrease in stress hormones. So um, absolutely, I think that whales will benefit from reduced noise um, in the ocean during this time. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, and then one final question, which has been asked by a lot of people tonight. So we've talked a lot about the Save Right Whales Act, but what are some other ways that um, people who care about right whales can show their support and help save this species? Um, and Erica, do you wanna start? Sure, I guess, you know, writing um, and participating in public comment periods is always super helpful, but um, there are a few other more um, practical things one could do. If you're a recreational boater, you could download the, um, the right whale alert app application and uh, it'll show you where right whales are um, in real time and you can report them, um, at least the ones that are reported. I say in real time, but since we can't tag them, it doesn't show those. But for those right whales that have been seen either by NIMPS or by some other confirmed source, they'll show up on the right whale app and a boater can know to slow down, go um, keep your distance. You're legally required to be 500 yards away from a right whale at all times. Um, don't fly drones over their heads. Um, you know, watch them from a safe distance. Uh, there are um, occasionally, I, I think I saw a chat comment um, on the bar briefly from a veterinarian. There are disentanglement teams that occasionally look for um, help from the veterinary community. Um, and there's probably lots of things I'm forgetting. Um, uh, Heather, do you have other thoughts on what people could do? Um, I guess one one other thing is um, to to contribute or participate as a member in organizations that do this kind of work and and other work like the um, Center for Coastal Studies and the New England Aquarium Conservation Law Foundation. All of all of the organizations on on this webinar do really good work, and we're always in need of funds. Yeah, I agree. Supporting organizations who are doing um, the, the hard work. Um, I think also, again, being good stewards of the ocean um, will help. Supporting local industry who are working towards sustainable solutions. There are many fishermen who um, are part of the consortium and who are on the TRT and, and they, um, are, they don't want to hurt whales. They want to maintain their livelihood and protect the whales at the same time. And so there are um, fishermen and, and industry members who are doing really good work. Um, I think being educated, just knowing that the, the species is out there, the species is struggling, and um, sharing that, that knowledge with others who may not be aware, um, I think that's also really important. Um, and yeah, just to add on to that, um, you, we've shared this link with you all that contains um, a portal where you can write to your elected officials. So sharing that on social media um, and other stories about right whales on social media is another really great way to educate and build some awareness um, in your community. So I, we are a little bit over time tonight, but it's great. So many people were so engaged um, and I had a great time being a part of this this evening um, and I will you know continue to be in touch as we continue to work to protect right whales there is a comment period that's coming up hopefully over the summer um, but timelines are a little shifted right now 
Well, you'll, you'll have the opportunity to submit a comment to protect right whales. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and thank you for attending this evening and a big thank you to all our panelists too. Have good nights, everyone, and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela.